Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34 today. And the word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he, meaning Jesus, said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day. Before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Amen. I want to talk to us this afternoon for a while on the topic, Get up, brush off, move on. Amen. Get up, brush off, move on. If you'll bow your heads with me one more time. Master, we so love you. We are so grateful today, God, for the presence of the Lord. Most of all, God, we're grateful for your grace that indeed today is greater than all our sin. Our humanity, God, our feelings, our faults are not beyond the grace of God. Lord, you went to the cross so that we might have mercy that is unearned. That, it, that we have not done anything to deserve. Lord, you've not called us to a gospel of works, but you've called us to a gospel of grace through faith. And Master, today the word of God must go forth. I am, as always, Lord, your humble servant. There's not anything that I might say that would benefit bless, help, encourage, inspire the people of God today, except for the touch of the Holy Ghost. I need the anointing, Lord. I need you to touch me. I need you to touch my mind. Deliver me, God, from every distraction. Help me to focus. Help me, God, to speak that which you would have me to speak, and, Lord, to refrain from that which you would not have me speak. Bless the people of God today, Lord. Let this word be an encouragement to those today who are struggling in their walk with God. For we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Yeah, see, this arm here is busted. It's kind of weak. There you go. Thanks. Praise the name of the Lord. We've read today from our primary text. That portion of scripture that many of us, if not most of us, are pretty familiar with. Jesus is speaking with Peter prior to his being taken in by the authorities and facing the judgment hall of Pilate. And the Lord is... Well, <clears throat> And the Lord is speaking with Peter. And he's, he's talking about, he's speaking with all of the disciples. He's talking about the difficulties that they're about to face and the terrible things that are about to happen. And he turns to Peter and he specifically says to Peter, Peter, you know, the devil wants you, boy. The devil would love to put you through the ringer. He'd love to put you through the meat grinder. How many times have you felt like the enemy has been trying to sift you like wheat? Hello now. How many times have you felt like the enemy is trying to put you through a meat grinder and he's really trying to rough you up and give you a hard time? And the Lord says to Peter, he said, you know, the enemy has really got his eye on you. I've set you aside and set you apart for a very special, unique, and powerful 
position within the early church and the enemy of your soul would like nothing more than to derail you at this point. He said, but I have prayed for you. Oh, hallelujah. I'm so glad to know, and I wish more believers would understand today, that God is on your side. Amen. God is not against you by any means. He is not sitting around waiting to judge you or condemn you or criticize you. The Lord said, but I have prayed for you. Glory to God. When God knows that the enemy has something in store for you, I've got news for you today. He is on your side. Glory to God. I'm so glad to know that in my trials, in my difficulties, in my tribulations, in my temptations, God is on my side and he's working on my behalf. And then Peter jumps in as Peter so often loved to do. Said, oh Lord, I'm ready to go with you. Whatever you face, I'm ready to go through it with you. I'm even willing to die with you if that's necessary. And the Lord turns to Peter and he said, oh Peter, said, I got news for you, honey, the cock ain't going to crow a couple of times, but that you've already denied me three times. And Peter, I can just imagine, was looking at him wide-eyed like, well, why in the world would you say that? Well, I'll tell you why he'd say that. Listen to me, children. Because God also, he's on our side, but God also knows our failures and our faults, and our sins, listen to me now, before we've even committed them. The Lord knew Peter was going to fall. The Lord knew Peter was going to fail. He knew Peter was going to go through a rough time. And that he was not going to have the stamina and the ability to stand for Jesus that he was here professing. The Lord knew in advance. He knew before it happened that Peter was not going to be able to do what he thought he could do. What he was professing he would do. But the Lord says to him, Peter, so let me tell you, I prayed for you and I'll tell you why. Because I, I want your faith not to fail. See, a lot of people lose out with God. A lot of people backslide. A lot of people give up on the Christian faith. Not because they choose sin over living a godly life. Not because they want to go back to what they knew at one time. Not because... Uh, they no longer believe in Calvary. They no longer believe in the cross. They no longer believe in the blood. They no longer believe in the name. They no longer believe in the reality of the Holy Ghost baptism or Jesus' name baptism. No, those issues are pretty much settled in their mind, but they go back because they've experienced a failure in their life. They've experienced a falling in their life. Somewhere, somewhere along the line, they had a bad day. And man, I mean to tell you, they did something stupid. They acted in a way that a Christian ought not to act. And they allowed the enemy to use this event against them. And they could not forgive themselves for their conduct. Are you hearing what I'm telling you today? They allowed their failure, they allowed their faltering, their stumbling to condemn them. And it became bigger in their mind than God's grace was. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, listen. In Matthew 26, verses 69 through 75, the Word of God tells us this is when Peter actually falls and actually denies the Lord. Now Peter sat without in the palace. And a damsel came unto him saying, Thou also was thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. 
And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow also was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bewrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Every believer has experienced at some point in time a failure or a faltering in their speech, their attitude, or their conduct which they know in their heart is not in keeping with Christian living. Satan loves to jump on these situations and try to introduce fear, doubt, and condemnation. But the truth today is this. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ does not enable you to suddenly somehow live a perfect life but rather it secures your place in the rapture so at the sound of the trumpet you will be in a place to be perfected. Our human nature will always war against the leadership of the Holy Ghost. This is the constant reality for every Christian living within the effects of Earth's gravitational pull. The key to overcoming and winning the war, despite losing the occasional battle, is to seek God's forgiveness through acknowledgement of our failing and then pressing on. Hallelujah. Leaving all memories of that sin in the past. Sin is not the only thing that trips us up, folks, and causes us to quit the race. Oftentimes, simply the remembrance of sin will do the trick. Can. See, just because you fall out and you have a cussing jag, or just because you fall out and you do something you ought not to do, just because you say something or you do something that as a child of God you know better than to do, that that doesn't automatically put you outside of the faith. That doesn't automatically knock you out of the church. And i got news for you today. I don't care what first quote-unquote holiness church says. It don't put you out of the rapture either. If it puts you out of the rapture, then God's grace is worthless and it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. No, those things don't amount to a hill of beans in God's eyes. The Word of God said, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What do we have to do in order to accomplish that? All we have to do is confess it. If we confess our sins, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, honey, all you got to do, it's a simple thing. You, it, it doesn't take uh, uh, walking across glass on your hands and knees. It doesn't take uh, crawling, you know, three miles down the Via Della Rosa. It doesn't take any big religious act. It doesn't take... Uh, any, you know, uh, monstrous activity that causes pain and woe on you. No, the Word of God said simply all we must do is confess it. You don't know how many times a day sometimes I have to look up toward Him and say, Lord, forgive me, God, what a dumb thing I just did. What a stupid thing I just did. And I know, according to the promise of God's Word, that once I confess it and I acknowledge it, it is settled. If I allow now the memory of that to torment me and to condemn me, it's on me. Did you hear me today? Because now I'm not trusting what the Word of God has promised. 
Word of God said, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if I allow the memory of that thing to haunt me and torment me and cause me to say, oh, why do I even bother trying to live for God? Why do I even bother trying to be a Christian? I keep goofing up. I keep screwing up. I keep doing things I ought not to do. I quit. I'm just not even going to try anymore. If I do that, what I'm in reality doing is saying to God, I don't trust your promise. I don't trust your word. You said all I had to do was confess it, and it'll be settled forever in heaven. But I don't trust you. Oh my goodness, think about it now. That's a powerful thought, isn't it? Amen. That's a powerful thought. Peter went out and he wept bitterly. As he realized, wait a minute, this is what the Lord told me was going to happen. Got news for you, honey. God knew you were going to fall before you ever fell. God knew you were going to screw up that day before you ever messed up. God knew you were going to have a hard time. God knew you were going to give in to that temptation. God knew you were going to succumb to that situation. It didn't catch him by surprise. It might have caught you by surprise, but it didn't catch God by surprise. That's why God says, listen, you know what? I knew before it ever happened. I know the ending from the beginning. I knew before it ever happened what was going to happen. So here, I've made it really simple for you. Here's an easy way to deal with it. Confess it. It's forgiven. It's forgotten. It's gone. Hallelujah. Once you've settled the matter with God, get up, brush off, move on. I've said many times, when the Lord gives me messages sometimes, depending on, you know, the nature of the message and what have you, when it deals with certain subjects, whatever subject that may be, I'm almost nervous to preach it. Because without fail, I kid you not, without fail, the very thing that I will preach on, I'm going to experience within a matter of days. It happens every time. Every time. If I preach about, you know, certain kinds of temptations or certain kinds of things, without fail, that's going to come at me after a short while. If I preach about this, it comes at me. If I preach about it's like the enemy said, all right, preacher, you just preached on this. Now let me try you in this area and see how you make out. Well, guess what? Satan beat the Lord to the draw this week. God had already given me this message for this Sunday. And last week, an incident happened a couple days ago, a few days ago. An incident happened, and I blew my wig, and I went off, and I had a fit, and I mean, I just was not at all what I should have been. I wasn't acting the way I should have acted. I'm telling the truth. See, most preachers get up and they try to act like they're perfect and that every word they say, you know, is from experience. Oh, I've attained perfection and I'm up here to help you. I'm not up here to be an example to you of perfection. I'm up here to be an example to you of someone who's living for the Lord the way you need to live for the Lord. Well, part of that includes being like Peter. Sometimes I fall. Sometimes I falter. Sometimes Don't anybody think I went sleeping with somebody. Don't anybody think I murdered anybody. Don't anybody think. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. But I just, you know, mostly it involved my mouth. And uh, I said some things I should have never said. In a, in a moment of passion, I suppose you might say. Well, I'm going to tell you, when that happens to me, and it happens more often than I'd care to confess it happens, but it happens every single time I feel terrible about it. I, every time. because Not because for one moment I think that I'd miss the rapture on account of that. No. I understand God's grace better than that. It's not 
not the rapture that I'm going to miss, but what I have done is I've compromised my testimony. I've compromised my integrity, you know, and my testimony, my Christian testimony. And that ought to be of the highest concern to every believer. Especially if you do something or say something, you know, you act out the fool in front of unbelievers, you know. Because then you're hardly setting the example as the child of God that you ought to be setting for unbelievers, you know. And that is what disturbs me the most is when I do or say something I shouldn't have said uh, in front of other people that, you know, it may forever affect my testimony, my witness with them. And that's what it was. That's what it amounted to. But boy, I'm going to tell you, I wind up coming under such a load of guilt and shame. And I almost immediately was saying, oh God, forgive me, Lord, oh God. You know, I could offer a thousand excuses. I could offer a hundred reasons for why this happened. And folks, a lot of the reasoning, a lot of what folks would call excuses for me are very legitimate. It's, it's not that my reasoning isn't legitimate. For instance, when my sugar drops, Tommy can tell you, um, I lose my mind at times. If my sugar gets low enough, my whole thinking process goes bonkers. When I first found out I was diabetic, my doctor told me, because I told her, I said, I go through these periods where I, like my whole personality changes, and all of a sudden, I'll, I'll cuss, I'll say things I would never say any other time. I said, I just literally, it's like I go out of my mind, and I'll feel shaky, and all this stuff is happening in my body, you know, and all. And she said, well... When a diabetic person experiences hypoglycemia, where your blood sugar drops low, very low, she said what literally happens is it's almost like being drunk. She said you literally, your inhibitions, your ability to control your inhibitions gets thrown out the window. She said, that is why a person who's the severe diabetic... If you ever watched the movie Steel Magnolias, you remember Julia Roberts played a girl with the diabetes. And at one point, she was in the, the barber's chair with Dolly Parton, and they were working on her hair, and she started having a, a fit, you know. And... Uh, her mother was, oh, you know, get her some orange juice, get her in there, trying to help her. And she's just sitting there, and she's getting mad, and she's getting angry, and she's saying mean things to her mom, you know. Well, the only reason she was doing that is because of what her body was going through. Well, I can tell you honestly, I didn't realize it the other day because I wasn't paying attention. But apparently my sugar dropped, and I picked the wrong time to try to talk to this person. And this person picked the wrong time to look me in the eye and say, Well, Charles, F you. And they didn't use the letter, they used the word. That, well, that, that was the wrong day, honey. That, that was not a good time to pull that stunt on me. And uh, when it was all over, Tommy can tell you, I come back in the house and I'm shaking, right? I was all shaking. See, I didn't realize my blood sugar had dropped. I didn't realize I was at that point. So I had to grab some orange juice real quick and then try to eat something. You know, I could offer all kinds of reasons and the reasons may be legitimate. A lot of people will justify wrong behavior and wrong conduct by reason of the fact that they can explain it. Well, you know, growing up as a kid, I experienced this, and, and, and your explanation may be a thousand percent accurate. You may be absolutely right, but I got news for you. It doesn't justify the behavior. If you keep justifying wrong behavior by yourself with your explanations and your excuses, then what happens is you begin to rely upon your explanations for justification rather than rely upon God's grace. Am I telling the truth? See, if I just offered an explanation 
And I allowed that explanation to be my end all and be all. And bless God, well, you know what? My sugar was low and that's why that happened. Then I never look up toward heaven like I ought to and say, God, forgive me, Lord. Help me not to do that again. Am I telling the truth? See, we can't afford to do that. You cannot afford to allow your explanations or your excuses to justify wrong conduct. No, you still need to confess it. You still need to acknowledge it before God and let God deal with it. Amen. Let God throw it into the sea of forgetfulness. Amen. When God throws it into the sea of forgetfulness, thank God, He means for Him not to remember it again. Listen to me now. And He means for you not to remember it again. Come on, folks. Get up. Brush off. Move on. Hallelujah. That is how to respond. Don't allow the remembrance of sin or failure. Don't allow the remembrance of weakness to cause you to fall and fail. In Matthew 26, verses 20 through 25, Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Jesus that is, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. So here again we see the Lord knows we're going to fail before we failed. God knows we're going to experience a bad day before we have a bad day. God knows our sin, our fault, our failing, our frailty, our weakness. He knows these things before they ever happen. Why do we act like when these things happen we're somehow or another surprising God? God knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew in advance. He knew Peter was going to fail. Do you follow? He knew Peter would deny him. He knew in advance. What's the difference between Peter and Judas? Well, the Word of God tells us in Matthew 27, verses 3 3, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he, Jesus, was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priests took the pieces of silver in the temple, and departed, excuse me, and said, it is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. The Lord knew Peter was going to deny him. The Lord knew that Judas was going to betray him. You know, we read the words of Jesus concerning Judas. He said, 
The guy that's going to betray me, it'd be better for him. He had never been born than he did this. Now, why do you suppose the Lord said that? Well, a lot of people immediately assume, boy, he was letting him know, bless God, that the judgment of God was going to come down on his head. That God was going to cast him into hell and burn him like a fried pig skin. No, that's not necessarily the case at all. Could very well be that the Lord knew that this poor guy would find himself under such a load and such a weight of condemnation and guilt that even after he repented of the conduct, he'd never be able to forgive himself. Am I telling the truth? Could be very well the Lord knew. Listen, you know, this poor guy, it'd have been better he'd never been born because the response and the reaction he's going to have is such that he'll never be able to look past this. He'll never be able to get up. He'll never be able to brush off. And he'll never be able to move on. Peter ultimately did. But Judas didn't. Judas repented. And the word of God said, when you repent, you need to bring forth meat under repentance. You need to do something that is uh, evidence of your penitent heart, you know, that you've genuinely repented. Well, Judas did. He went back to the priest. He threw the money on the floor of the temple and said, I don't want this money. I've betrayed innocent blood. Am I telling the truth? So not only had Judas repented, but he had also brought forth me down to repentance. He had demonstrated that he repented. He didn't go then and spend the money on a new chariot or on, on, on a new camel or something. No, he showed that his heart was sincere and that he was truly repentant. And he cast out the money. But then he allowed the remembrance of that failure to condemn him. And he killed himself. He hung himself. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people wind up going to their grave at their own hand because of the remembrance of failure. They don't trust God. And I've been there. I've been that depressed. I've been in that position. So by no means am I condemning anyone by saying these words. But you've got to remember, if you're thinking now such thoughts, you've got to remember honey, the word of God is true. The word of God is faithful. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God shall stand forever. If God said he'll forgive it, all you need to do is confess it, acknowledge it. Then I've got news for you today. That's a fact. That's the truth. You can count on it. You can take it to the bank. So don't let the remembrance of that action, don't let the remembrance of that failure, don't let the remembrance of that faltering condemn you. Don't do something that is forever. Don't end your life over something that God said, I will easily, handily take care of in heaven if you'll just confess it and acknowledge it. And once you've done that, all you have to do is get up, brush off, move on. Hallelujah. Am I telling the truth today? Praise the name of the Lord. It's not easy doing this. Our moments and our our moments of weakness and our failings, as I've said before, are not at all a surprise to God. The Word of God said He knows our frame. He knows that we are dust. And he is aware of the end from the very beginning. He knew Peter would deny him. He knows you will at times slip and fall. He is not obsessed with or concerned about what we have done in the way of failure, but rather what we will do after we have failed. Did you hear what I said? The Lord is not as much concerned with your failure as he is with how you're going to react to that failure. That's why he said to Peter, Peter, I've prayed for you so that your faith fail not. What was he saying? He, he didn't even talk about Peter falling. He didn't condemn Peter for the fact he was going to deny him. He didn't rebuke Peter for the fact he was going to... Now he rebuked Peter on a number of occasions for showing lack of faith and all this. 
And yet here he said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. He didn't condemn him. He didn't criticize him. He said, but when it's all done, I pray for you so that your faith will fail not. I'm not concerned about what you do so much as how you react and how you respond to what you've done. Oh, hallelujah. God is not as concerned about the things that we do in our weakness and in our human frailty as he is with how we will respond to that. Are you going to lose your faith over it? Are you going to forfeit your faith over it? Are you going to give up on your walk with God? Are you going to stop living the Christian life over something that God said, I'll forgive it? And this is my promise. All you have to do is confess it. If you'll just acknowledge it, it's forgiven, it's forgotten, it's gone. All I want you to do is to get up, brush off, and move on. Hallelujah. We can turn our faults and our weaknesses into a positive thing by ministering to others who may be facing similar trials and temptations. A former drug user, for instance, can best minister to a drug user. A recovered alcoholic can best minister to an alcoholic. An LGBT believer can best minister to an LGBT backslider. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Mm -hmm. See, that's why today I'm pastoring an LGBT affirming church. Folks, I got news for you. When I came back into ministry after being out of church for a few years, I didn't know anything about LGBT affirming theology. I didn't know anything about LGBT affirming churches. I literally didn't know that a single one in the planet existed. I had no idea. Never heard of them, didn't know anything about them. I didn't want to preach. I had no intention to go back to preaching, but the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and, and said, I want you to start this bookstore and this library and this coffee shop ministry in Brooklyn. So my former partner and I opened an outreach center. Uh, we called it uh, Apostolic Learning Center in Brooklyn. And I was going to operate strictly a parachurch ministry type thing, you know? Well, preachers and Christians began to come into our store, and Jason and I, we, we didn't know how to approach affirming ministry. I had no clue. So basically, we started out with a don't ask, don't tell policy, you might say, okay? And Nobody ever seemed to ask us, so that wasn't an issue, you know. And I began to meet preachers from the community, preachers around. And they said, well, you're a preacher, aren't you? Well, I got news for you. God called me to preach when I was eight. And if I said, no, I'm not, I'd be denying the call of God on my life, and I can't do that. That wouldn't be right. So I simply said, well, yeah, you know, yeah, but I'm not preaching right now. We have this ministry. And they said, well, why don't you come preach for me Sunday? And I, I said, Lord, what in the world am I going to do? What in the world am I going to do? I, I, Lord, I don't know what to do. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, what did you do before you went out of church? I said, well, Lord, I, I, you told me when you called me to preach that wherever a door was opened, I was to walk through that door. He said, exactly. Why would you do anything any different now than you did then? If a door is open to you, you walk through that door. I said, but Lord, the situation's different now. You know, I've got a partner of a few years, and... And, you know, my life is different, and I, I don't want to cause any conflict. Right? And the Spirit of the Lord said, if the door is open, you walk through that door. I said, okay, all right. So all of a sudden, Tommy, I begin to preach in Pentecostal churches and apostolic churches all over New York City and Connecticut, New Jersey. All of a sudden, I'm getting invited. There was hardly a weekend that I wasn't preaching somewhere. Um... We started having a Bible study at the Learning Center on, I think it was on a Tuesday night, if I remember correctly. And 
churches sent people from apostolic mainstream churches sent their people on their buses to our Bible study. We were running 30, 40 people every Tuesday night at our Bible study, and we had about three different churches that used their church van or their church bus to carry people to our Bible study on Tuesday night. The pastors of those churches told me, Brother, we love your teaching. We love the gift that God's given you. We love the anointing that you have. And I feel like my people can benefit from your ministry, so I'm happy to send anybody that wants to go on the church bus. I'm happy to send anybody who wants to go on the church van. All of a sudden, I'm preaching like I've never been out of church for one minute. You want proof that God can forgive and forget. Hello now. You want proof that when God says, all you got to do is acknowledge and confess and I will uh, take care of things and it'll be settled forever in heaven. Honey, you can't find any better proof than this. It was as if I'd never been out of ministry for one minute. And I've got news for you. We began to experience moves of God, my great God in heaven. We saw moves of the Holy Ghost like you have not ever seen. Believe me. I had uh, a Spanish pastor in one particular church that we had an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in his church during a, a fellowship meeting with several churches that had come together, all Spanish Pentecostal churches. And the Holy Ghost fell in that meeting. I cast demons out of one lady. People got the Holy Ghost. People got healed. People were shouting and dancing in the aisle. And we were just having church all over the place. And after the service, the pastor said to me, I have never, ever in my life seen a church service like this. He said, I've never seen anything like it in my life. He said, this is the most powerful most a mind-boggling move of God I've ever seen in my life. Here I was, a gay preacher. There sat my partner, two seats behind the front pew, watching me preach, and the Holy Ghost fell. Pastor, what are you trying to tell me? Well, number one, I'm trying to tell you when God says that He'll take care of it and when, once He takes care of it, you move on. Amen. Don't dwell on your failings because believe me, I have done so many dumb and foolish and sinful and horrible things during the few years I was out of church that if I let the remembrance of those things keep me back, oh, believe me, I could have never, never mind preach, I could have never so much as walked into a church if I would let the memory of those things hold me back. But I knew what the Word of God promised, I knew what the Word of God said, and I trust God to, to, to keep His Word. But beyond this, beyond merely God indeed forgives and forgets as He says He does, I still had a burden for the LGBT community. I still had a burden for people like myself who were in the LGBT community who had fallen away from the church, who had fallen away from God because they falsely believed that the grace of God did not apply to them. They falsely believed that there was no place for them in the kingdom of God and in the church of God. And I still had a burden, Tommy, for our people. And I began to do a lot of writing. I wrote all kinds of articles. And we, uh, Jason and I created uh, booklets of the articles that I wrote and stuff. And... Um, they dealt with LGBT issues because I began to search out, you know, LGBT scriptures and what have you. And really, the first issue was grace. God told me, he said, the first issue you need to deal with is not whether this passage means what it looks like it means or whether there's deeper meaning if you do a little bit of searching. But you need to look into grace. And one of the first things I did was this lengthy, 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 like 40-page study on grace that I wrote, wrote it out. 
And when I got done with that study, I said, my God, the church does not understand grace at all from a biblical perspective. The message the church preaches today isn't even close to the message that the apostles and the early church preached. But here's my point. I said a few moments ago, our failings and our faltering and our slipping and our sliding and our sin can be a positive if we turn it toward helping those that we can help with our experience. The Lord said to Peter, he said, and when you've returned, he said, Peter, I know you're going to fall, but I also know you're going to get up, brush off, and move on. Hello now. And when you do that, strengthen the brethren. Use your experience to benefit and to help others who may go through or may have gone through something similar. Well, I could have easily, Jason and I could have easily just kept going on the way I was going, Tommy, preaching in churches. I was getting love offerings. Uh, I, I could have made a living preaching in mainstream churches, just operating on the premise of don't ask, don't tell. I could have easily done that. And the move of God and the, the, the things that were happening were so wonderful, I could easily have continued to do that. But I couldn't do that. Why? Because I had a unique experience as an LGBT person that I knew could help other LGBT people. And I had to find a way to try to reach and to minister to LGBT people. So I eventually, you know, I, I began to venture into... Uh, affirming ministry uh, deeper and deeper. You know, I began to study and research and write. And then uh, I found out there was a church in New York City where I lived at the time that was uh, LGBT affirming. And I was excited because I thought, well, praise God, I don't have to pastor a church. I can just attend a church. Because I was not, after everything I had done, believe me, I wasn't in any big hurry to try to be a preacher all of a sudden, especially in New York, because that's where I'd done a lot of stupid and dumb and sinful and horrible things. I couldn't walk down the street, literally, without being hit in the face with a place that I used to hang at, or, you know, a place where I did some nasty things at, you know, and the memories were just whap, 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 you know, everywhere I went, they were whacking me in the head. But I called the pastor of this particular church, if you want to call it that. And I said, well, are, are y'all Trinitarian? Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean? What? I said, uh, do y'all believe in the Trinity? Um, uh, I don't understand your question. I was like, you know what? I mean, if, if you claim to be a pastor and you don't understand, I'm not Trinitarian, but the point is I was just trying to feel out where they were coming from. So, you know, and so I said, well, let me ask you this. What do you believe concerning salvation? What does one have to do to be saved? Huh? What? I, I really don't understand your question. Literally, literally, this is what this way. And she's still pastoring this church to this minute. And she literally could not answer those two questions. Finally, I said, ma'am, your church ain't for me. Click. And I said, oh, Lord, now I've got to start a church. By now, my former partner had left me. He decided, somebody convinced him that he could not be LGBT and Christian. And we parted company. And uh, I eventually met somebody else, started another relationship, and this other person said, you know you need to start a church. And I said, oh, no. See, I'm telling you, I was resistant to starting a church. I had no desire to start a church. I wanted to reach out to LGBT people, but I was not, you know, in a hurry to go back to uh, pastoring. And uh, finally, I just said, okay, Lord, I need a church. I've got to have a church I can go to. And uh, so... I had been visiting all these other churches, preaching in all these other churches and stuff, you know. But, I mean, I couldn't go to them because they were mainstream and anti-gay and blah, 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 blah. 
And so anyway, uh, so I started my, my first affirming work in New York City. And from the first minute, it was an uphill battle. It was the worst experience of my life. It was a trial, and I've been at it now for over 26 years. And it has not changed one iota in a quarter of a century. It still is a constant uphill battle. It still is almost impossible. I mean literally impossible for us to get financial support, to get people to give a fly about what we're doing, to get people to support what we're doing. We have people all over the world who follow our videos and they watch our live services and they benefit from our ministry. The only problem is all these people don't live in Dallas, Texas. If they all lived in Dallas, Texas, we'd have a mega church. But for all the people that watch us and follow us online, we have less than half a dozen people, including our local church members, who financially support this work. For all the people that we have watching online instead. It has been a battle every minute of every day. And I have struggled many, many times just to get up in the morning on Sunday and preach because... I'm not accustomed to failure. I'm not accustomed to feeling like a failure. I'm not accustomed to not seeing with my naked eye progress and things. I'm, hey, when I was preaching in the mainstream churches, we were having Holy Ghost outpourings like you can't believe. I'm not accustomed to this. This is a whole different ball of wax for me. Well, Pastor, why do you keep doing it? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus said to Peter, when you've returned, strengthen the brethren. You've got a unique experience. You've got something you can use to benefit a specific group of people. Use your experience to benefit them. I have to use my experience as an LGBT person of faith. And I have to use my experience of battling my way back into the faith and back into the church and, and understanding the grace of God and understanding the truth of God. Uh, I have to use that to benefit LGBT people because if I don't, I will be disappointing the Lord. You know what cracks me up about LGBT people? They love to go to mainstream churches. They love to pay their tithes to mainstream churches that have big choirs and have big orchestras and have all these things going on because they don't give a damn. I'm going to use the word about LGBT people who are backslidden and going to hell. They're not about to attend an LGBT affirming church where they might be able to help pray through people who are struggling, who are fighting their way. Uh, we have people that come into our church that over the years who are so under a load of condemnation and guilt that has been put on them over the years in other churches. And Tommy, you know, and they just cannot overcome that. They wind up going right back into the world. They wind up going right back uh, out into sin because they just cannot believe for one minute that God will accept them and God will receive them. And you know what? We don't have a whole bunch of people here around them that are able to encourage them and help them to believe that yes, indeed you can. Yes, in fact you can. I've been where you've been. We don't have a lot of that. No, because these people would rather go to mainstream churches where they can be a little mini celebrity, where they can be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond, where they can sing specials and have people applaud for them, where they can sing in the choir where they can play their instrument in the band. But I don't believe for one minute that's the will and plan of God. God says, no, Peter, you, you've got experience you can use to benefit somebody else. Do that. If you're an LGBT person and you have the ability to support or to attend an LGBT affirming church 
that you believe in, that, that is of the faith that you believe in, and you don't, I pity you when it comes time to stand before God in the judgment. I'm not saying you're going to go to hell, but I guarantee you that you're going to find out that God was not pleased with that conduct. The Word of God tells us in closing today, Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Where did these come from? Oh well, <laughs> they were in my other pocket. Brethren, Paul writes, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I, don't, I know better than to think I'm perfect. Said, but you know, here's how I respond to failure. Here's how I respond to sin. Here's how I respond to doing things ought not to do. I press on. Amen. Hallelujah. I get up, I brush off, and I move on. Hallelujah. I haven't... Hey, if there was, if there was a man on this planet who could have made the claim to perfection, it might have been the Apostle Paul. And yet Paul clearly says... I count not myself to have apprehended. said, I have not laid hands on perfect, perfection as of yet. Lastly, in Romans 7, 14 through 23, this same Paul writes, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For that I would... That do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. What, Paul? You're a Holy Ghost-filled believer, Paul. You're an apostle of Jesus Christ. You're standing here telling me the things that you don't want to do, you do, and the things you do want to do, you don't do? Why, Paul, don't you understand who you are? Don't you understand Pentecostal doctrine? Don't you understand apostolic teaching? What's wrong with you, Paul? You'd be put out of 1st UPC for saying that today. Sure would. Things I don't want to do, I do. The things I don't want to do, that's what I'm doing. Things that I do want to do, I don't do those things. Hello now, but listen, he said, but it's not me sinning. Listen, listen, but it's sin that dwelleth in me. Paul, you're a child of God. You're a Holy Ghost filled believer. And you're saying that sin dwells in you? And we wonder why in other parts of Scripture the Bible said that believers don't sin. And that if you sin, you're not a believer. Why is that? Is it because believers don't do sinful things? Nope. Listen to what Paul said. Paul said, it's no longer I, but sin that dwelleth in me. In other words, as a child of God, you're no longer responsible for that sin because of the grace of God. You're not held accountable for that sin. No, that sin is simply in your life as a child of God because as long as you're in the uh, influence of gravity, sin is within you. But God looks at it as, oh, that isn't Paul's sin, and that's the sin that's in Paul's sin. And when something happens, all Paul does is say, Lord, forgive me, God, help me, Lord. I do, help me not to do that again. The Lord said, all right, Paul, forgiven, forgotten forever. Amen. Get up, brush off, move on. Hallelujah. Let's finish this portion today. He said, for I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. He said, I have the will, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. You know the old saying, the flesh is, uh, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. 
for the good that I would do not, excuse me, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not, if I do the things that I don't want to do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Again, Paul says this for the second time. Verse 21, I find then a law. What is a law? A law is an established fact. This is something God has established. He said, I find then a law, an established fact, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. My inside man, my spiritual man, all I want to do is the right thing. All I want to do is say the right thing, do the right thing, act the right way, be the right way. He said, verse 23 in closing, But I see another law in my members, or in my body, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Don't let your failing, don't let your sin, don't let your behavior, don't let weakness and moments of frailty and failure, don't let those things condemn you. Don't let them tear you away from God. Don't let them pull you away from the faith that is in Jesus Christ. Folks, God knew it was going to happen before it ever happened. And he was for you before it ever happened. He said, but I've prayed for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, listen, I'm on your side. I'm not working against you. I'm not waiting. I'm not sitting in heaven waiting for you to fail. I'm up there. I've, I've set things up in such a fashion that these issues are easily dealt with. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He said, I tried to make it as easy as I possibly could for you. Listen to me today. God is saying to you and I, when it comes to sin, when it comes to failure, when it comes to frailty, I know it's there. I know it's going to show its ugly head from time to time. But when it does, get up. Brush off, move on. Hallelujah. Which is heaven.